Owen Emerson. I'm a social and cultural historian and I'm the castle historian and assistant curator at Hever Castle. Thank you so much, Dr. Owen Emerson, for joining me to talk about Hever Castle, the childhood home of Anne Boleyn, and later the home of Anne of Cleves. So those of us who are huge Tudor fans and love the Six Wives really are in for a treat hearing more about Hever. I am so grateful that you are joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be on your wonderful podcast and to be talking all about uh, our lovely Six Queens. So yes, it's a yes. pleasure for me. Well, thank you. And we had Kate McCaffrey earlier, which was a real treat. So I'm so excited. I feel like it's one of those situations where I don't want to pinch myself and wake myself up because if I'm really talking to people at Hever Castle, that's a dream I want to stay in. Oh, so <laughs> we're just going to jump right in and talk a little bit about the Christmas season at Hever. So can you tell us, what do we know about Christmas celebrations at Hever? How was the holiday celebrated in times past? Well, that's such a great question because obviously the further back in history that we go, the less we probably know about uh, the Christmases that were spent at Hever. Um, so we probably know more about the Christmases spent at Hever uh, by its last sort of resident owners, the Astor family, than we do say about the Berlins. Um, but having said that, we do know that the Berlins, on at least two occasions, celebrated some rather important Christmases at Hever, and I'm sure we will be talking uh, a bit more about that uh, later on in the episode. Uh, Hever is, of course, a castle. It's a, a defensive place, but it's always been a home. Um, most castles, in fact, the vast majority of castles were homes and therefore um, Christmases would have been a, a central part of that um, uh, home experience. And I think it's a, a really evocative time to be at Hever. We still celebrate the most wonderful Christmases uh, there and the place really comes alive, I think. So today we really um, like to evoke the past by decorating in a variety of different ways, but also by lighting candles and lighting fires. And you really get a, a sense of what a, a, a Christmas at Hever in the past would have been like. And I think we can safely say that during the Berlin's tenure, a Christmas at Hever would have been a very heady experience indeed. This was a, a real time for celebration, for reflection. Uh, it's a deeply uh, religious uh, period of time. And I think Alison Sim sort of says it best about this period, that it's sort of like a safety valve. It's a, it's a time that um, the, the family can be quiet and together, but also celebrate and um mark the 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 passing of the midwinter phase um so yes i i think the a berlin christmas would have been quite unique and particularly the christmases that we know that they did actually spend there they are in very significant periods in their family history um so Yes, whenever I'm extinguishing the candles of a night at Hever when our current celebrations are on, I often think about how exciting it would have been at Christmas for the Berlins at Hever. Oh, that sounds just wonderful. And the notion of candles and fires and the flickering lights and the decorations is just sort of a magical time. It really is. It really, um, I think there's something quite um, ex extraordinary actually about the senses and how they give us a sense of the past. I'm immediately thinking of the wonderful Amy License's brilliant new book all about the senses in the Tudor period uh, and how they sort of tapped into the experience and I think those 
smells and sights really have a, a, a unique way of drawing us into the past and giving us a sense of what that experience would have been like. That's wonderful. And Amy's book hopped into my mind just as you were saying that. So yes, yes, the notion of the immersion in our senses of that. And that's a great way because we can really sort of experience some of the things they did. As you mentioned, blowing out the candle in the room, descending into darkness. I mean, that just sounds so like we've stepped back in time. Yes, it, it really sort of shrinks that distance, I think, when we have those experiences of smelling and, and sort of visualising what the chambers would have looked like. Because, of course, when they lit by candlelight, they look quite different to the aesthetic you get with electric light. So I think we're immediately sort of transported that little bit closer when we have those experiences. And and I think there's something really exciting and interesting about um, the emotions that come with those senses as well. I'm sure we've all been experiences where we smell um, someone's perfume, perhaps, who we've lost for the first time um, after their passing. And the immediacy of uh, the emotions that sort of um, come flooding back almost. Um, there's a, a sort of a recoil. Um, and I'm, I'm as a, a historian who really focuses on emotion, on a daily basis i'm really interested between the relationship of the senses and the past so um yes it's quite amazing to be in that place during christmas time oh that's wonderful a wonderful way of describing it as shrinking the distance and speaking of that as you mentioned there were a couple of key moments in Anne Boleyn's life where we know right that they spent that she would have been at heaver for christmas and leaving and if you can think about the senses as well leaving the frenetic court scene and going back to the place that was her home and the different way that would have felt for her and the different emotions so we know in the holiday season the christmas season of 1526 to 27 uh this is around the time that the king and anne decided to marry and Anne is at Hever for Christmas. Is that right? And can you tell us about that? It absolutely is. It's quite an exceptional Christmas at Hever. And I think of the many Christmases that the Berlins spent there, that must have been the most exciting, I think. And if I could travel back to any of the Christmases of Hever's past, I would go to that one Christmas. And I think it must have been the most extravagant because they are really on the rise at this point. But also, I think it's the most significant. You know, by by 1526, the Berlins are really riding high at court. Thomas Berlin um, is one of Henry VIII's most trusted diplomats. He's been made by Count Rochford and his son, George, has been appointed the royal cupbearer. Um, and of course, it's Anne that Henry is focusing on. Uh, at the the time. Uh, Catherine of Aragon's uh, premiership is on the wane and Anne's star is on the rise, as the wonderful Kate McCaffrey says. And and with all these achievements under their belt, the Berlins really do have a huge amount to celebrate during that Christmas. Um, And they, I, I don't think it's by mistake that they choose to spend it at Hever. It is their family headquarters. And time and time and again, we see the Berlins retreating to Hever at significant uh, periods of their story. I think this is because it's a small property. It's really at the centre of Thomas Berlin's world. And it's a place where they can be private because of that um, size. And I think uh, in spite of it being uh, not the most prestigious property in their portfolio of properties, it would have been a rather lavish affair that Christmas. Um, There are such amazing opportunities on the horizon because Henry has turned his eye towards Anne. Um, Now, we know that Anne is at Hever during this period because for... um, Henry's New Year's gift and and gifts were gifted on New Year's Day and not Christmas Day in the the Tudor period. Anne sends Henry a really significant jewel. 
It's a bejeweled ship with a, a droplet diamond and it has a maiden aboard. And this lavish little trinket is full of symbolism. And I think it would have sent shockwaves through the court when it was presented publicly to the king. This is Anne telling Henry that she, the damsel in the in the ship, is willing to sort of jump aboard to Henry's boat toward matrimony. And she's telling him that she's prepared to weather the rough seas ahead and become his wife and queen. Now, Henry sends Anne one of the famous letters that we still have uh, in reply, thanking her. Uh, not for her gift, but he uses specifically the word etreme, which is a New Year's gift. And he also acknowledges the significance of what she has done at this point. Essentially, she's acquiescing to his uh, proposal. And it's really hard to think of a more momentous, uh, sorry, a more monumental decision that Anne has just made. She's set sail on a voyage that will lead to the break with the Roman church uh, and establish Henry as the head of the Church of England, all to place that crown upon Anne's head. And that journey sets sail from Hever Castle when, when Anne decides uh, to accept Henry's promise of marriage. So I'm thinking that this was a really important, lavish time for the Boleyns, Anne is probably getting counsel from her family and they are probably having a right royal knees up, I should imagine. Oh, that's a wonderful description. I love the notion that the journey, her journey set sail from Hever. That's just a wonderful way to think about that. And as you describe it, it brings to mind the recent television production that you were involved in about the Boleyn family. Yes. As a family gathered at home, counseling together. It's just really easy to imagine that, having seen that production, which I know <clears throat> parts of that were filmed at Hever, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it was so exciting, actually, to be able to see not only the family sort of fit into the walls at Hever, because, of course, a lot of our visitors often say, well, this is quite a small property, but I do reassure them we do have room for all of the Boleyns to fit in at Hever. Um, <laughs> but it was actually quite magical, um, not only to be a part of that wonderful three-part BBC series, but to see their story coming to life at Hever. And I think it's actually quite surprising, and, and maybe quite surprising to your listeners, to know that very few story, uh, you know, dramas or television documentaries or television dramas have actually been shot at Hever Castle. Um, Anne of the Thousand Days was a great exception, uh, mm -hmm. but because of the floods of 1968, which really did a huge amount of damage to Hever, very few, if any, scenes were actually shot inside because of the water damage. In fact, I think the only scene that you see um, where someone's in the castle itself is when the wonderful jean Vierre Bujold is hanging out of a, a window to, to greet Henry. Um, so yes, actually seeing those experiences brought to life in those very walls that the Berlin's occupied and seeing it lit by candlelight and beautifully dressed with tapestry and arras was quite an amazing experience for me, I have to confess, yes. Yes, and it was a wonderful way for viewers to imagine this family of real people. I think sometimes we lose the sense because of the fame of Anne Boleyn and all of the differing opinions that this was a real person and she had a real family around her. And so that's great. And Christmas time is a wonderful time to think of them coming together. Now, the next year, so that was 26 to 27. And then the next year, 27 to 28, um, Anne and Henry were betrothed, but he was at court with Catherine, who was still officially the queen and his wife. So tell us about that, because I think Anne came to Hever again that year. Is that right? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. So Anne spends um, both uh, the Christmas of 1526, 27, 
and also the Christmas of 1527-28 at Hever. Um, and as you say, Catherine of Aragon is still very much Henry's queen, and she presides over the celebrations at court, while Anne has to sort of silinkosh, shall we say, to uh, Hever Castle to spend it with her family. Um, it must have been actually excruciating for Catherine to know that Henry has this other woman. I mean, I, I feel dreadfully sorry for her. And throughout this period, Catherine is utterly magnificent, if you ask me. She really does her duty well. I mean, it's really hard to find any kind of criticism toward how she um, uh, deals with the situation. So Catherine is very much queen at court during the 12 days of Christmas and Anne is at Hever. And we know that Anne is still at Hever in February of 1528 when she acts as a host to, to Stephen Gardner and Edward Fox, who, of course, are en route to see the Pope. So all of this uh, that is going on is, is huge in terms of Anne's future, in terms of the country's future. And again, Hever is acting as the nexus here. This is where the future is sort of being realised in the walls of, of Hever Castle. Um, so yes, again, maybe Anne believed that this was going to be a short affair, or maybe she was had a bit more sense about her and realised that this was an unprecedented event and that it was going to take uh, a few more years than... Um, perhaps the king anticipated it would. Um, but yes, she's very much a heaver in uh, that uh, other Christmas with her family. And uh, again, I'm, I'm imagining that with the, the kind of gifts that uh, Henry is bestowing upon both Anne and her family, that we're looking at quite a lavish affair again. Well, yes. And it's interesting to think in the year that's passed between her accepting his proposal and sending back the um, gift with the maiden in the ship to sort of, you know, signal that to him. And then a year's gone by and, you know, just the difference in that and how she was, you know, there with her family at Christmas. And I wonder if she realized now, wasn't that her final Christmas at Hever? From then on, she was at court. Is that right? Absolutely. I mean, everything's sort of changing, isn't it? Um, so we don't have any other recorded um, instances of her being uh, at uh, Hever for Christmas. So um, things are really changing for Anne and they're going to change significantly in the coming years. Um, I, I often wonder if Anne looked back to her time at Hever, particularly perhaps in her final days. We know that uh, Elizabeth is very concerned about her mother's welfare, uh, Elizabeth Boleyn being fairly ill at the time of Anne's uh, arrest. Um, so yes, I often wonder how much uh, headspace was, was left for Hever during those uh, unprecedented heady days that um, Anne Rose. So, uh, yes, this is our, our final Christmas with our Heaver Queen. Well, and it's just really remarkable to think about her journey. As you said, I love this phrase, setting sail from Heaver. And boy, perhaps and certainly even stormier waters on that journey and storms greater than she might have imagined. And um, I can imagine her in the tower just wishing she were back at Heaver. <laughs> that would be you know such a warm and comforting place and you know of course she was not allowed to return yes. so later this beautiful home actually becomes the home of another of henry's wives named anne anne of cleves so can you tell us a little bit about how anne of cleves might have either celebrated Christmas at Hever or what we know about the life of Anne of Cleves at Hever. Absolutely. Well, Hever, let's start with where, how Hever really got into to Anne of Cleves' hands. Um, Anne, of course, is brutally slaughtered in 1536, as is her brother, 
uh, George Boleyn, the only remaining male um, heir of Thomas and Elizabeth Boleyn. Um, so Thomas and Elizabeth have lost their heir and uh, therefore the property of Hever and other Boleyn properties um, are uh, inherited for a very short period of time by James Boleyn, who is Thomas Boleyn's brother. Um, he has no needs for the Kentish properties and therefore he sells them by indenture to Henry VIII. So uh, this crown uh, jewel of the Boleyns, Hever Castle, um, the, you know, the, the family that Henry has just utterly destroyed is all of a sudden part of the king's portfolio of properties. Um, I don't think Henry has any uh, desire to live in a Boleyn property and his uh, court is so enormous that it would be almost impossible for him to spend any uh, significant periods of time there. Um, Henry's fourth wife and queen is, as you say, Anne of Cleves. She spends her first Christmas uh, uh, in 1540 braving the rough seas uh, to journey to England to marry uh, Henry VIII. And of course, the marriage is an unmitigated disaster. It ends in an annulment six months later. And we do know that Anne is actually welcome back to court. She maintains a good relationship with Henry. And uh, he, of course, calls her the king's sister. We even know that she dances with her former lady-in-waiting and new queen, Catherine Howard, um, uh, during her Christmas festivities at court. Um, now, in the annulment settlement, Henry is particularly generous to Anne. She doesn't um, prevent any of uh, the annulment procedures against uh, the marriage. And she's gifted a, a good property portfolio. Uh, two of the properties are very prestigious indeed. One of them is Richmond Palace and the other is the Palace of Bletchingley. And these appear to have been Anne's favoured properties uh, during the remaining Henrican reign. But of course, Henry dies and Anne is no longer the king's sister, but the step on, shall we say, to the new king, Edward VI. And Hever was part of the portfolio of properties that had been gifted to Anne. And we believe that she used Hever more as a hunting lodge uh, while she had the palaces of Bletchingley and Richmond. Um, Kent, of course, is full of boar and deer. And we know that Anne likes and enjoys hunting. Indeed, we have correspondence from Hever to her brother William, um, uh, thanking him for some hunting birds that he had sent to Hever. Um, but the Regency Council, Edward's Regency Council, uh, eventually strips uh, her right to uh, the Palace of Richmond and Bletchingley. And it appears after this point that Anne spends a good deal of her time at Hever. Um, now, she doesn't own Hever per se. Uh, she actually rents it. We know exactly how much rent she paid. She paid £9, 13 shillings and three and a half pence per annum to the Court of Augmentation. And uh, but the Crown actually essentially pays the rent because uh, she gets a, 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 an a allowance from uh, the King. Um, and I think she would have, in those later years, spent a good number of Christmases at Hever. It's entirely possible that she did so. Um, we know that Anne enjoys entertaining very much indeed. Uh, so again, I should think the Christmases that she spent at Hever uh, would have been rather uh, uh, comfortable, shall we say. Um, but we also know that Anne very much enjoys cooking. Um, that's something that really fascinates me about Anne's character. Anne, of course, is born into a royal family, but it was entirely um, appropriate for a woman of her station to learn uh, cookery. Um, which is quite distinct from how we would imagine uh, the royal uh, princesses being brought up in the, in the English court. Um, and we have evidence that she continues this um, uh, uh, 
shall we say, hobby of, of cooking uh, long after she has um, uh, retired from being the queen, shall we say. It was actually entirely conventional for a woman of Anne's station to uh, in, enjoy learning to cook. It was part of her education, and this, this really sets it apart from the education of noble women and princesses in England. Um, and we know that long after the annulment from Henry, Anne can be found cooking. Indeed, one of her household, uh, Thomas Carden, actually complains about Anne cooking in a letter to the council uh, when she uh, makes a return visit to Bletchingley. Uh, which Thomas Carden has been allowed to occupy following Anne's uh, revocation of um, uh, being allowed to do so. Uh, so, yes, I think Anne, Christmas at, with Anne of Cleves would have been a bit of a knees up, if you ask me. I think she really enjoyed uh, entertainment, lavish uh, feasting, and I'd certainly like an invite from her, if I'm honest. It almost makes me laugh out loud to think that someone's complaining about her cooking. That is just a sign of a, a view of her or a way of knowing her that I think we don't. We don't realize this was someone who would just go back to a place that she used to be able to go to and start cooking and kind of annoy the person who's there. I think that's wonderful. If people are lucky enough to get to Hever now, what can they look forward to? for a Heaver Christmas this year or the modern Heaver Christmas? Tell us some of the treats that you have in store for visitors who might be able to visit. Gosh, it's honestly one of my favourite times of the year at Heaver Castle. And as I speak, our castle is being decorated by our wonderful shop manager, Ashley, who does the most phenomenal job with decorating our castle. Um, for Christmas. Every year we have a different theme and the theme this year is the story of Pinocchio. Uh, so lots of lovely um, things for children to enjoy by way of a, a trail in the garden which will take them on a magical journey of that uh, lovely little story. Um, but what I think I love most about A Christmas at Heaver is the sort of juxtapositions of lots of different kind of traditions uh, that all come together and provide just a wonderful experience. So um, we usually have about 25 different trees in the castle, uh, which is amazing. And it, again, it's sort of tapping into that past experience, that bringing in of evergreens that was very, very popular during the Tudor era. Of course, they didn't have Christmas trees in the Tudor era. These are a much later um, uh, import, shall we say. Mm -hmm. Um, but yes, everything is just dressed beautifully and we have flickering candles everywhere. And of course, you can go and see the big man himself, um, which is always uh, important. And we open actually later during the Christmas period because roughly about four o'clock, the whole estate is lit in the most amazing wash of colours. I mean, every colour you can think of, every tree is lit up. And um, also we have things like um, a, a, a traditional carousel on the castle forecourt for people in, to enjoy. It's just a feast of uh, anything and everything Christmassy. And I really cannot recommend it highly enough. My family and I always go as close to Christmas as we possibly can and it really feels like that's the beginning of our Christmas celebration. So if you if you love Christmas, if you love history, then you know, make sure you come to Hever. It's absolutely amazing experience. Well I think with an invitation like that we should all just rush out and get our tickets. So <laughs> <laughs> that sounds wonderful. And I want to thank you for sharing all of the wonder of Hever Christmas through time with a couple of our favorites, Anne Boleyn and Anne of Cleves, the whole Boleyn family, and then Anne of Cleves making a new life for herself. The history of Hever right up until the way you can celebrate Christmas there now. So that is wonderful. And thank you so much. Now, tell us 
where we can find more about you, more about Hever, and what to keep looking for. Bless you. I'm so pleased you've enjoyed it. It's been lovely chatting with you. Um, I do have a website, which is drowenemerson.com. If you'd like to visit that, or you can find me on social media. I'm generally Dr. Owen Emerson at, uh, in you know, things like Twitter and uh, Instagram. Uh, I do enjoy a bit of social media from time to time. Um, and I've just published a book uh, all about the Berlins of Hever Castle with my wonderful friend and colleague, Claire Ridgway. Uh, that tells the, the story of the 77 years that Hever was occupied by the Berlins. Uh, it takes you on a visual journey as well as a narrative uh, of how the castle would have looked in the Berlin's time, what's changed, what's the same. Um, that was an absolute pleasure to, to write with Claire. And um, yeah, we've got a, a really exciting number of events coming up at Hever. So do check out Hever Castle's website and look at the events page because we've got loads of goodies coming up. Uh, not just next year, but over the next few years, we're going to have exhibitions and events. So please do uh, keep an eye out on Heaver's social media as well. Um, yes, lots of exciting things coming up in the future. Well, that's wonderful. And we can't wait. And I will say I have this beautiful, the Boleyns of Heaver Castle. It is a prime part of my collection and it's right next to me right now as I'm speaking oh, with you. Owen because it's so <laughs> exciting to do so and I, I I have warned you that the next time I'm able to visit England I am coming book in hand to track you down for a signature but <laughs> oh, it will be a pleasure I cannot say enough about visiting Hever it is a dream come true and um, so I encourage us all when we're able to travel again to to make a plan for that there are wonderful exhibitions coming so thank you so much, Dr. Owen Emerson, for spending this time with us, for taking us back in time to see how the journey of Anne Boleyn set sail from Hever Castle and how Hever continued to be such an important place and plays such an important role through history and continues to give us wonderful Christmas celebrations. So thank you so much. You're so welcome. Thank you so very much for having me. All right. And thank you all for listening. And we'll see you again soon. So many thanks to Dr. Owen Emerson for joining us and telling us all about holiday history at Hever Castle, one of my absolute favorite places to visit. And thank you for joining us and spending some of your holiday with the Royals, Rebels, and Romantics. Please think about subscribing, leaving a rating, giving me a shout. I would love to hear from you. And speaking of shouting, I would like to give a big shout out to our new patron, Robin Malay, who has joined our Royals, Rebels, and Romantics patron family. Thank you, Robin. Hope you are all having a very happy holiday season, and let's keep shaking up history together. Music